Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our program. What does this election mean today? We're going to go ahead and get started shortly. But before we do, I just wanted to give notice of our upcoming programs that the center will be having. So on November 20th, we will be having a film discussion on disclosure. Be sure to register for that at equaldignity.org. And lastly, I'm going to give a short disclaimer. All comments of the moderators and guests of our programs represent the thoughts of each individual and do not represent an official position of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. Now it is my great honor to introduce our moderator for this program, Andrea Young. Andrea Young joined the ACLU of Georgia as an executive director in January, 2017. Under her leadership, the organization has grown in influence, impact and membership, battling injustice and inequality through the courts, legislative advocacy and community engagement. Voter rights, women's rights and criminal and criminal legal system reform are priorities in the affiliates 2020 to 2023 strategic plan. Andrea, as an attorney, nonprofit leader, and author, has devoted her career to promoting policies to defend and extend civil and human rights. Prior to joining the ACLU, she taught leadership and social policy at Georgia State University, was the founding executive director of the Andrew Young Foundation, and created the Making of Modern Atlanta project that included an archive, documentary, film, and book. She has worked as a congressional and state aide and a nonprofit leader to end apartheid in South Africa, established the Martin Luther King holiday, created expanded support for working families, expand access to reproductive health care, and expanded access to early childhood education. Andrea has worked for civil rights all her life and joined the Selma March in 1965. That perspe perspective is the bedrock of her commitment to the eighth CLU of Georgia. Andrea has received numerous awards for her work recently from the YWCA of Metropolitan Atlanta, the Georgia Association of Black Women Attorneys, and the Islamic Speakers Bureau. She's founding board member at the National Center for Civil Rights. Please join me in welcoming Andrea Young. Um, thank you very much. Um, really pleased to be with you today. I don't know if we're going to be able to answer this question, but we're going to absolutely give you tremendous um, context uh, for what is for what is happening in our community right now. Uh, before I introduce our very distinguished panel, I want to set the context. Nationally, more than 160 million people have cast ballots. Uh, in the presidential election. In Georgia, more than 5 million. Uh, we've seen the power of Black voters, and we'll talk about that, even given that the Voting Rights Act was gutted in 2013. One of the important exhibits uh, in the Civil, Center for Civil and Human Rights is the Voting Rights Act, uh, the battle for that in the Selma March. We saw the end of preclearance and the rise of accusations of voter fraud. So what we're hearing is not new. We've been hearing this since 20, 2012, uh, always un unsubstantiated, unfounded, uh, but nevertheless persistent. We saw a passing of measures with surgical precision, and that's from a court, to reduce the impact of black voters. We saw racial gerrymandering, poll closures, voter purges, voter and photo ID laws, all with a disproportionate negative impact on lower income, younger voters, Black and Latinx voters. We saw voters in Florida remove bans on voting by people with former felony convictions, only to have the legislators improve, impose new barriers. We saw voters in Michigan approve a ballot measure that expanded early voting, vote by mail, and same day registration. Right now, the Georgia presidential race is undergoing a recount. Two Senate seats have gone up to a runoff in Georgia. Uh, which will happen uh, on January 5th, or as we say now in Georgia, the final day to vote in that prime, in that runoff uh, is January 5th. So I'm really pleased to have uh, Dr. Elsie Scott and Mr. Jerry Gonzalez uh, to be a part of this. Uh, they are uh, incredibly well versed in this topic and have been working on these issues for quite some time. Uh, Jerry Gonzalez uh, is the founding and current executive director 
uh, of the Georgia Association of Latin, Latino Elected Officials uh, and the Galeo Latino Community Development Fund, a statewide nonprofit and nonpartisan organization that has a mission to increase civic engagement and leadership development of the Latino community across Georgia. And this is a very important point, the increase and the incredible leadership development that Jerry has done over the years. Uh, he's a native of Laredo, Texas, received his BS in mechanical engineering, MS, uh, his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Texas A&M, completed his master's in public administration at the Andrew Young School of Public Policy at Georgia State University. And due to his efforts, Mr. Gonzalez has been recognized by Georgia Trend Magazine as one of Georgia's 100 most influential Georgians for several years. Uh, Dr. Elsie Scott uh, is the director of the Ron Walters Leadership and Public Policy Center at Howard University. Uh, shout out to Howard uh, and the home, the, uh, the alma mater of our new vice president. Uh, and actually, I have to say, in my family, we, we're uh, my dad, granddad, sister, and niece are all uh, Howard alums. So they're going to they're quite have quite a swagger going on right now. Uh, she served as president of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation uh, before accepting the present position. Uh, she's also served as executive director of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives and has, has held faculty positions at several universities, including Howard, Rutgers, North Carolina Central, and the University of Central Florida. She received her undergraduate degree from Southern University in Baton Rouge her master's degree from the University of Iowa and her PhD from uh, what is now Clark Atlanta University. She serves on the research committee for the Black Women's Roundtable and analyzes data collected by the Essence Poll collected every, conducted every year. She's also a contributor to the Status of Black Women Annual Report published uh, by the Black Women's Roundtable. And of course, we're gonna hear and talk about Black women and the incredible role that Black women have, have played uh, in, in our political life all the way. You know, we're also in the 100th year of suffrage. Uh, so it's an incredible time um, that for, for this conversation. Uh, thank you all for being a part of this. Uh, you all are both, pro, both pros and have done incredible work over a long period of time. Uh, and I think that's one of the important things about this context is that what we have, what we're seeing right now, is a long time in the making. Um, and so, if each of you could give me a short, to give us a, 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 a short history of some of the barriers to political participation in the Black and Latinx communities in this country, and some of the things that have been done to sort of get us to this to this point. Jerry, we'll start with you. Well, thank you, Andrea, and uh, thank you for setting the context really well. I think, uh, I mean, Georgia certainly is a, at, a, at a crossroads of national implications and national importance, uh, given the two Senate races that we're facing uh, in determining the outcome of for, for January. Uh, and But there's been a, a long road to get here to the point to where we actually uh, have Georgia in, in, in this position for national importance. Uh, Georgia is a voter suppression state, uh, and it's not by accident. It's not by uh, by oversight. It is intentional. Uh, there's this cuts by death by cuts of a million a million paper cuts. Death by a million paper cuts is is how I would characterize it, because Georgia there there's there's all kinds of uh, voter suppression tactics that the state uh, continues to implement uh, in regards to making it more difficult for voters to exercise their right to vote. Uh, one thing that we're still in litigation against the state that I'll bring up is uh, is clearly the exact match process. If your name doesn't match exactly with the driver services data, which is uh, which has been proven to be inaccurate and incorrect. Uh, then you're flagged as a non-citizen and you have to take extra steps to verify either your citizenship or your identity in order for you to be a duly registered voter. 
Uh, if that happens on election day, it may involve uh, you having to visit the elections office and then go back to your polling location in order for you to, to be able to uh, correct the situation. Uh, we've been fighting this type of uh, legislation that's been in existence in Georgia since 2008. Uh, we're still in federal court against the state of Georgia with this uh, litigation because it's, it's really had a disproportionate impact particularly in minority communities. Uh, of those impacted in the, in the 2018 election that we had, uh, which was when we filed the most recent lawsuit that we're filing still in federal court, uh, there were 88,000 people impacted by this process. Uh, the vast majority of them were black uh, from the black community. And then of course, significantly uh, impacted were Latinos and, and Asians. Uh, so there's there's mismatches in databases and people were being prevented from being able to exercise their right to vote because of those mismatches. One example I'll give uh, within the Latino community, for example, many people have multiple last names. Uh, and in certain databases, the last names, uh, one, one of the last names gets put in as a middle name. In some databases, the last names are separated by space. Some are separated by hyphens and some they're just mush them together and, and put it as one big long last name. So that creates problems in our community because of, because of the fact that, the, that they are eligible to, re to register to vote. They are US citizens. Because of this, uh, this process that the state has implemented, it continues to disproportionately impact uh, the Latino community, the black community and the Asian American community. That's just one example. Uh, language access is a big issue in Georgia that, uh, that uh, the counties and there's, a, there's a really a hostile uh, feeling uh, in by elections officials across the state in providing access to uh, language uh, for language minority uh, voters that exist in our state. One example is Gwinnett County. Years before uh, Gwinnett County was mandated by Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act to implement the uh, language access for Spanish speaking uh, dominant uh, community members, uh, we were telling them that they needed to take steps now to prepare. Uh, but not only did they say no, they said, hell no, we're not going to do that. Uh, you're either going to have to sue us or the, the federal government is going to have to mandate it in order for it to be put in place. Uh, this, year, this year in uh, election, uh, during the election cycle, DeKalb County became the first key in the state to voluntarily move forward with expanding language access for both languages uh, of Spanish and Korean, thanks to efforts by the Asian Americans advancing justice in, in, those, in those efforts. Uh, so that's, that's truly historic, uh, but I mean, similar, similar uh, experiences we've had in Hall County where, where the, uh, the elections officials there are belligerent against uh, language access issues and really are hostile towards us providing those language access uh, support services that our, that our community needs. Uh, so those are just two little quick examples about what happens in, in voter suppression in Georgia that we are seeing and that we continue to see. There's many others as well that, that I'm sure we can get into, but uh, we don't have time uh, to talk about all the voter suppression tactics that we have in the state. Right, yeah, no, thank you. And uh, Elsie, tell us about some of the, the journey that uh, African-Americans have had to try to get to, uh, to, get to this point. Yeah, uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having me. I look forward to this conversation. One of the best ways for me to talk about the journey is to make it sort of personal because like your father, my father was a civil rights activist and my father, much of my childhood, I watched my father and mother fight for voting rights uh, for black people in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. There were in 1962, there were three parishes, which are counties in other states in Louisiana where Black, no black person had voted since post reconstruction. And my father spent 15 years trying to get the right to vote for black people. And I had a chance to observe all the different tactics they used at that time. Uh, they had the literacy tests in Louisiana and a lot of people started mastering the questions on the tests because you know the NAACP had the tests. And as a child, I taught the tests to to people to help them prepare. But 
What they also had in Louisiana, they had a thing, you have to be able to read and interpret the constitution. And the registrar of voters would read something to you and ask you to interpret it. And then you never knew whether you interpreted it right because there was no right or wrong answer. Right. She'd tell you to define what is domestic tranquility. <laughs> and you say, what? But, uh, and so they kept this up. But one of the major reasons major impediments to black people getting the right to vote in Louisiana was not the poll tax like in Mississippi, which kept, was the ID law. And a lot of people say, well, I didn't know they had ID laws back then. Yes, they had ID laws, but instead of a piece of paper, you had to bring an individual. You had to have two people who were registered to vote to vouch mm -hmm. that you were a good character and deserving to have the right to vote. And with no black person in the whole parish uh, registered to vote in these three parishes, then for many years, black people couldn't get registered to vote. And I'll just quote from my father. He was saying that one lady said that, oh, I'll get registered to vote because I have white friends and they are Christians. And my father said that he told her, yes, uh, they may be Christians, but being Christians and knowing you enough to vote is different situation. So uh, finally, just to make this short, finally they got the right to vote through federal court. Mm -hmm. uh, the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department came and brought a lawsuit and they won the lawsuit. And then the registrar voters quit rather than to allow people to register vote in time for the upcoming election. Mm -hmm. So my father and mother 26 black people in East Carroll Parish, Louisiana were registered by a federal judge. And of course, then the people went to court and sued and said that a voting right, voting, uh, voting administration is a local function of government and a mm -hmm. federal judge does not have the right to register people. And so they appealed it to the Fifth Circuit Court. And of course, the Fifth Circuit Court threw it out and said the judge was in his right because nobody else was around to allow these people to register vote. So fast forward to 2020. And as uh, Jerry has already mentioned some of the tactics, we see some of the same tactics, but they're a little different format now. But you would think that by now we would see this, but much of this happened when they, uh, with Shelby versus Holder, when we got Shelby versus Holder from the Supreme Court which essentially, essentially valid, invalidated the Voting Rights Act. And so now you have to fight every individual case, uh, to try to get people registered to vote. And then every state just about now has uh, a voter ID card. Well, every state that was covered under the Voting Rights Act. And so there, you know, there's just many, many suppression issues that we observed in this election cycle. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to set that context because you see this record turnout. Uh, and having said all that, we even haven't talked about the impact of COVID-19. So in the midst of a pandemic, despite all these persistent barriers, uh, these communities really did turn out, uh, turn out to vote. But the, it does not mean, you know, sometimes it's this catch-22, we overcome the barriers and then people use that as an ex excuse to say, oh, we'll see there are no barriers because look at this turnout. So we just wanted to be clear that this level of turnout happened despite the continuing barriers to participation by especially the black and Latin, Latinx community. But of course they're not the same. And so in Georgia, what is the Latinx community comprised of and what are some of the one, you know, what happened, I mean, to the extent that you know at this point, Jerry, what did the turnout look like? And, and kind of how do we need to think about the, the Latinx community and as voters? Sure. Um, so let me do a little context laying as well. Um, I started as an organization in Georgia in 2003. There were, we did a baseline uh, assessment and there were only about 10,000 Latinos registered to vote statewide. Now it's estimated to be about 250,000 strong. Uh, the Latino electorate in Georgia for several election cycles now have outpaced the national Latino voter participation rate. So Latinos in Georgia are outpacing the national numbers 
uh, significantly in uh, and and even more so by 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 double digit percentages in in certain counties uh, because there's been a concerted effort to engage the community and to turn out the community. So uh, so it's it's been it's been a, a an effort to make sure that that that's that's the case. Now with regards to uh, turnout this election cycle, leading into the the numbers that we've seen so far are only from the early voting and the absentee voting, but even at those numbers were record breaking and those numbers were approaching the levels for overall turnout in previous election cycles. So we know that we're going to see record turnout of the Latino uh, community, uh, Latino voters in Georgia. And, and I know that there's a lot of, there's a lot of questions about uh, well, okay, they're turning out, but who are they voting for? Is a situation that happened, in, and there was a there was some polling indicated uh, what happened in Florida with regards to increasing support for the Trump administration. The polling that was done specifically in Georgia by the best polling uh, that does uh, polling for the Latino community, Latino decisions, indicated that uh, that actually uh, Biden had seventy percent of the percentage of the voter the voters that actually turned out to vote in this election cycle. So I wanted to make that clear. It's sort of where that's the snapshot in time of where the Latino community is. But when you look at the Latino community and the Latino voters, the average age of a Latino voter in Georgia is a millennial. Mm. Uh, the average age of a Georgia voter is probably a baby boomer. Mm -hmm. Or uh, so, so that just means that the 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 strength and power and the longevity of the Latino vote will continue to grow, will continue to have tremendous impact, not just in a tight statewide competitive race like what we saw. Biden is ahead by fourteen thousand points or fourteen thousand votes here in Georgia. Um, so not not just in tight competitive races, but what we also saw was it was essential in uh, counties like Cobb and Gwinnett County. Uh, Latinos were paying attention not just to the presidential race, but also to like a race for sheriff, as an example. Um, there were uh, situations where Democratic candidates for sheriff were on a clear platform that they wanted to end the 287G program in the county. And 287G is a program that partners with Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And they've, they've been responsible for tearing apart many thousands of families, of Latino families and immigrant families uh, all across uh, Cobb County and Gwinnett County for stupid minor traffic violations that end up uh, being processed in jail and then end up being deported and torn apart from their families. Uh, so the Latino community is wholesale opposed to those, those types of enforcement practices that, that really tear up, tear up our families. So what we had in, in Gwinnett County, for example, was a, a, a black democratic uh, sheriff candidate that was running against a Latino Republican uh, candidate. Uh, and the Latino candidate uh, is of Mexican descent, but he was in support of the 287G program. Uh, Latinos saw real, real through that and, and really uh, 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 clearly the Democratic uh, candidate ended up winning uh, in that particular race overwhelmingly. Uh, and I think the Latino community, the number one place of Latino voters in Georgia with the highest density of Latino voters and the highest number of Latino voters is Gwinnett County. And then number two is Cobb County. Uh, the same thing happened in Cobb County where you had uh, what we call them Wild West Warren uh, who had been sheriff for a long, long, long time and got cozy with white nationalists and, and really spewed some racist stuff uh, against the immigrant and the black community, really. Uh, it was a horrible sheriff uh, for Cobb County. Uh, he was up for reelection and he was, again, faced a Democratic candidate, a black candidate that, uh, that uh, was against the 287G program and he won overwhelmingly as well. So that's significant, particularly for those two uh, biggest counties in in the metro area because uh, those counties have unfortunately uh, there's there's books that can be written about those two counties because there's a hysteric uh, racism that has existed in those counties against both black and Latino communities and Asian communities too. Yeah, I think that's a really wonderful story, and that Georgia is actually setting an important example. The ACLU 
worked very hard, uh, you know, on the 287G issue and to, uh, and so to have the, the Black and Latino community come together behind Black candidates, uh, you know, what is, I think is something that, that we really need to continue to talk about. And also in both those counties, Black women, Elsie, were elected to chair the county commission. Uh, and so it was a tremendous, uh, it was a tremendous coming together of communities on common issues, making common ground uh, and people really, or, you know, not letting sort of ethnic differences get in the way, but really focused on the issues and, and really powering progressive change in those communities. So, so how are we looking at, uh, you know, sort of at the impact of the Black vote uh, right now, and particularly the leadership of Black women, as we see, we've got this new um, we, we, uh, this new achievement at the top of the ticket, but also we saw around the country uh, the impact of Black voters and, and Black women in particular. Yes, Black, Black women, some people say they showed up and they showed out, but Black women had been increasing their political involvement since 2008. That was the first time in a national election where Black women was the highest demographic in terms of turnout. And I remember Dorothy Height sitting, was sitting at the National Council of Negro Women after that election and her calling that to our attention and saying that, you know, we really need to get recognized for that because at that point, nobody was talking about it. But this year, everybody's talking about Black women starting with uh, what we call the uh, MVP, Madam Vice President. <laughs> but uh, she has caused, on. <laughs> <laughs> she caused a lot of excitement uh, because she's a woman, because she's a uh, immigrant background and because she graduated from an HBCU. And so, you know, there are a lot of things to get excited about uh, her winning that, but beyond, you know, beyond the vice presidency, uh, we can look down ballot at some other achievements. But I just want to come back to uh, to something that Jerry, I think, was highlighting, is that a lot of people want to put the weight of the election on ethnic groups, on, on racial minorities, and they want to, when something doesn't happen right, say, oh, the black men didn't come out. Oh, the Hispanics, the Latinos didn't come. And so, you know, but why are we hearing this about white women? White women did not come out for Hillary Clinton in the last election. And then we thought this year that uh, President Trump's, uh, his sexism would be enough to send a lot of white women uh, over to vote with the Democrats. But we still, when we look at the statistics, we still see a lot of white women voting uh, Republican. I'm uh, trying to find my uh, stats here. In the election, 32% of the voters were white women. 44% voted for Biden. 55% voted for Trump. And so uh, when we look at black people, we look at black men, black men made up 4% of the, this is based on NBC's uh, exit polls. Black men made up 4%. Black men voted 79% for Biden, 19% for Trump. Black women, 8%, 90% voted for Biden, 9% for Trump. And so because there was an increase in black men voting for Trump this time. A lot of people want to say, well, black men threw, black men almost threw the election. That is not the case. Uh, and even when you look at overall black, black vote for Republicans, before, before Obama was elected, really about, used to have about 11% mm -hmm. of the, uh, the votes used to go to Republicans from black people. And so it only went down when Obama became, when Obama ran for, for office. And I think he only, uh, his opponent only got like 4%. And the second time around, he only got about 6%. And so because 
because in the last election, 2016, because Trump got 8% uh, of black vote, then they want to say this time, well, Trump really brought in black vote, black people deserted because 11% went to Trump. But if you go back and look at history, you'll see that this was just regularly the percentage of uh, black people that usually vote for the, uh, for the Republican party. So, you know, it's not that every black person has to vote for Democrats. That, uh, that this time there were a lot of Republicans, black Republicans that were put in the race. And in some cases we saw black Republicans like you mentioned about the, uh, the Latina uh, and put in the race to sort of muddy the race and to make you think because there is a black person in the race that that black person has your best interests at heart. But when you look at what the issues that that black Republican might've been supporting and you know, I'm not here to support any political party, but you still have to look at what the platform is, no matter what political party it is. And then more likely, you know, just based on the top of the ticket where there was a lot of racism, a lot of sexism, a lot of discriminatory uh, comments made, white supremacy uh, support. And so you can't help but have a lot of black people say, that you know, the Republican party is not in my interest because of what they're hearing from the top of the ticket. And so uh, for the whites this time to put a lot of Republicans in the races, and uh, especially if you look at Congress, there are a lot of women that ran on the Republican ticket because finally the Republicans felt, they looked at 20, 2018 and how many women got elected to Congress but they were primarily Democrats. So they've put a lot of Republican women out there this time. And a lot of them did win, but not one of the black Republican women that was that ran in this election won the election. So, uh, so you know, we are very proud of the fact that black women, even where you didn't have black women running for office, that you had black women leadership, like you all have a best example here in Georgia. And I'm sure there'll be right, there'll be a lot of books and articles written about the role of black women in the Georgia election and what this means for the future. You know, we talk about what does this mean? We don't know what all of this will mean uh, for the future of uh, a black women's engagement in politics. But we were very proud of the fact that despite the pandemic, that people found a way to go out and uh, and and get their vote and cast their vote, and that despite the voter suppression issues, despite despite everything they put in the way, you know, uh, drop boxes only putting one drop box in a whole county, Harris County, Texas, and yeah. just a lot of stuff, and even some of it was supported by the uh, by the legal by the judges, yeah. but they still continued to vote, and so. There, there's a group of black women that I also want to highlight right now. It's the black women lawyers. Uh, Cheryl Lynn Eiffel from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Uh, Christian uh, Clark from the Lawyers Committee. These women were leading and they had lawyers around this country. Every time you would get a new suppression tactic put out there, they would file a lawsuit. And so we have to recognize that their leadership had a big impact also. Yes, yeah. And uh, the um, uh, and I'll take that as one of the ones down in Georgia and <laughs> ACLU's. We've been really into, I mean, ACLU and on the ground, of course, Stacey Abrams, we have to, you know, have to give uh, a shout out to um, Aunt Helen Butler. I mean, there are lots of women in the state of Georgia who, have, again, who were doing this when it wasn't cool? You in know, in say, uh, yeah, is uh, lots of lots of black women that were really instrumental in the civic yeah. engagement. Yeah, so right. we, so since we're since we're here, we will we will shout out our our and shivas, you know, Natasha, Natasha Brown with Asian Americans Advancing Justice. I should, um, the they're just. Uh, 
and, and I think the multi, you know, I think the multicultural collaboration that's happened in Georgia has just been extraordinary that, you know, African, I mean, we have tables that include the rich diversity uh, of this community that work together and have do, been doing it. I mean, for, for how long, Jerry? I mean, you've seen it get bigger and bigger with that pro-Georgia table, but before, I mean, I've been at it for, you know, I've seen it in operation for four years, but you know, even before that, really trying to come together and make sure that people had al were aligned in terms of their policy goals. So we start with the policy, you know, and, and what we say about the partisan, we can't help it if one party, you know, is here and the other party is like way over there. But what are some of the issues you think that were driving turnout um, in, in, in your community? You've mentioned the immigration um, but what are some of the other issues you think were driving turnout, Jerry? Well, uh, I think immigration, the lens of immigration was used clearly in, in the Gwinnett and Cobb County votes for sheriff. Uh, that was a, a driving issue for, for Latino voters that knew about, that knew very clearly about the 287G program. But I think, I mean, uh, Latino voters in, in Georgia, uh, based on the polling that Latino decisions did as well, uh, indicated that the COVID response was a big concern. Uh, disproportionately Black and Latinos have been impacted from hospitalizations to uh, testing positive, to being in, uh, many are essential workers and have to go to work. Many have lost jobs because of the economic uh, impact that the pandemic has had as well on our communities. So COVID was really, COVID-19 in the current pandemic situation and the horrible mismanagement uh, from the president to our governor uh, about the COVID-19 and, and what, what is actually being done to, to curtail the impact of, of that on our communities uh, has really been horrible. So I think our communities were really looking at that as really what uh, they were uh, exercising their right to vote and, and had to go vote because uh, because many in our communities are being severely impacted by the, the current situation in the pandemic. And then we have, uh, again, Congress in a stalemate uh, without passing uh, much needed economic relief uh, uh, for the situation that, that our communities are in and suffering right now. Instead, uh, they're, they're, they're saying they're not going to be doing that. So again, it, it is, it, of course, the House is ready to do something, but uh, the Senate is, is really not willing to cooperate and wanting to do anything to move, move things forward. So I think that Latino voters and uh, were really went to the polls uh, primarily thinking about uh, COVID, but uh, when you look at uh, the issue of immigration is something that is sort of like, uh, okay, that makes you see things clearly. How are the candidates talking about our community mm -hmm. that we love and respect? In the state of Georgia, there's about a million Latinos uh, and more than half of those are foreign born and more than half of the foreign born are undocumented. So the issue of immigration and how a candidate talks about immigration is something that's near and dear. Uh, deferred action for childhood arrivals is just one example of, of the Trump administration ending such a popular program across uh, party, across uh, demographics that uh, many people around this country support the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals that President Obama uh, was pushed by dreamers to put into place. Uh, and, 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 and really we had the Trump administration very flippantly uh, and callously uh, end that program. So I think that uh, so the land of immigration is something that we, we, whether you're a Democrat or Republican in the Latino community, uh, you looked at uh, the immigration issue as uh, as the first thing is that you're going to look at what the candidate is saying before you listen to any other policy consideration that you may think of, because if you're talking bad about the livelihood of Latino businesses depend on immigrant workers, Latino businesses depend upon a clientele that is uh, that is immigrant. So if you scare away the business and you scare away the workers, uh, where is that going to leave for any economic development in, in, for Latino businesses? So you can talk about tax cuts all you want, but it doesn't matter if you lose your business because immigration is, 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 is coming down and, and chasing people away. So immigration is a really important issue in the Latino community, but uh, COVID, I think, took uh, the precedent and, and that's why we saw the turnout that we'd see. And I do want to give a shout out to Latinas too because Latinas are leading the way. 
Uh, Gigi Pedras has been doing amazing work with the Latino Community Fund of Georgia, uh, but also in the 2016 election, Georgia's uh, national uh, Georgia's voter participation rate outpaced the national Latino voter participation rate because Latinas showed up to vote at 73 percent uh, voter turnout. So Latinas in Georgia are leading the way. Uh, us men have to catch up with them to make sure that we can step up as well and take take ownership for what's happening in our communities as well. So we've got work to do on the on the on the side, but Latinas uh, got to give a shout out to Latinas as well. Yeah, yeah. What do you see? You know, absolutely. And what do you see, uh, Elsie? Is sort of quickly some of the issues that drove. Uh, Black voter turnout, and I also want to then get around to changes in the Black Caucus and the Hispanic Caucus on the Congressional. Well, we did a survey at Howard University of uh, some polling, and we looked at Black and uh, Latinx, uh, let, uh, Latinos in terms of what would drive them to the polls. This was pre-election, mm -hmm. and the top, the top uh, issue was COVID. And the um, for blacks, it was also racism that uh, was interesting. But health uh, health issues, health care was a big issue, as well as economic issues, unemployment, the effect of the uh, COVID nineteen on uh, people's employment, and also participated in the survey that we did with Essence Magazine, and the top. The number one issue for black women as they went to the polls was racism mm -hmm. and the country's ability or willingness to address racism, especially as it relate to the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And then COVID came in number two. So COVID, COVID is a big issue. And that's one of the issues that the new administration, and we see that they are already focused on it, but it's gonna be one that they're gonna have to address right away yeah. Uh, the health issues as well as the economic issues. Yeah. So, do you want me to talk about the uh, Black Caucus now? Yeah. So, what? So, we've got some. We've got some really uh, exciting new members of the. I'll give a shout out to Nakima Williams uh, from the Fifth Congressional District. Uh, but, uh, but who else are we? Who else are some of the new uh, exciting members of the of the caucus? And how big is the caucus now? Well, the the caucus. They're still counting votes. Okay. in uh, New York. So uh, Delgado, Representative Delgado, his his uh, district has not been called yet, mm -hmm. even though he was leading last night by about 8,500 votes. But what we are expecting now, let me see, I want to make sure I get the numbers right, because they it's kept changing. changing moment today. by moment, right? Yep, yep. So what's being projected now? Well, they're definitely be 27 black women, but none in the Senate because Kamala Harris is moving over to be vice president. Mm -hmm. So these, all these women will be in the House of Representatives. Two of them will not have a vote though. Mm -hmm. The non-voting delegates from DC and from the Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of black men, there will be 31 black men. And I think that's the same number that we had in the, uh, in the previous uh, Congress. Mm -hmm. Black women increased by two because uh, Congressman and, uh, Young, Andy Young was, I mean, uh, uh, Congressman <laughs> was uh, from, you know, from Georgia, John Lewis. Right. <laughs> Get right. all those mixed together. Congressman John Lewis is being replaced by a woman. Right. And then there was one member of the Black Caucus who was defeated by a Black woman in St. Louis. Right, Corey and, Bush. Uh, Clay was defeated by Cori Bush. And a lot of people are looking for great things from her. She's bringing a lot of young, youthful energy yeah. into the Congress. And there life, and life three, experience. Three new black men coming from New York. Mm -hmm. uh, one is a uh, Latino, Afro-Latina, uh, Richie Torres, mm -hmm. who's also gay, mm -hmm. openly gay. And you have Montier Jones, who's openly gay, he's a black man. Mm -hmm. And who's the third one? Uh, Jamal, Jamal Bowman. Jamal Bowman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have three coming there. 
none of the none of the members lost none of the existing members lost their race in this election because up until yesterday we it was iffy about representative underwood from suburban she, chicago she yes they she was declared oh, wow. she was declared winter, winter wow. Wow. so that's, that's so all of the women really lifted up the health care issue right what, what right. about She's the nurse yes and, and you have one new woman coming from uh, who's who's Afro Asian Afro Korean mm -hmm. coming from the state of Washington, Marilyn Strickland, the former mayor of uh, Tacoma, Washington. Wow! So the the caucus will probably be one or two uh, additions. So it'll probably it'll either be fifty seven or fifty eight wow. uh, black members in Congress. So clearly they will be uh, forced to be recognized. Yeah. Are forced to be reckoned with, so they just yeah. have to make certain that they find some common ground, you know, because you do have the youth, the young people having different views yeah. from uh, some of the members that's been there for a long time. And so, how about the how about um, new like are there new Latinx members of Congress? And I know they're not as heavily skewed Democrat, so there's a little more. Yeah, there, there is bipartisan yeah. uh, bipartisan yeah. representation increasing uh, for this. Chris. We have uh, Ben Ray Lujan, a Democrat from New Mexico, joining yeah. the U.S. Uh, yeah. We have uh, six uh, new member, members elect in the House of Representatives. Uh, there's uh, It's 50-50 men and women. Mm -hmm. We have Carlos Jimenez, a Republican from Florida, Tony Gonzalez, a Republican from Texas, Teresa Leger Fernandez, a Democrat from New Mexico, Nicole Maliatok Maliatakis, a Republican from New York, uh, and then we have uh, Maria Elvira Salazar, a Republican from Florida, and then of course uh, Richie Torres, a Democrat from New York, who's Afro-Latino and also openly gay as well. So there's there's a lot of great uh, diversity that's joining the ranks in Congress. I think it's really important uh, that that's going to be happening. So uh, so glad that glad that there's going to be increased representation. And here in Georgia Legislature, we lost. Uh, Representative Brenda Lopez Romero that uh, that was running for Congress and didn't win her congressional seat, but we have Representative Elect uh, Zulma Lopez that will be joining the Georgia Legislature, uh, and and we're glad that she's going to be uh, joining uh, others of the Hispanic Caucus there as well. And we may we keep our fingers crossed for a district attorney in uh, in Athens. Yes, uh, former Representative uh, Deborah Gonzalez is running uh, running uh, for a runoff election December first uh, uh, for the district attorney. She would be the first Latina district attorney in, in the state of Georgia. So that, that'll be historic. And also uh, I do have to point out in the in the Georgia Senate, uh, Senator elect uh, Jason Anavitarte, who was a form, former board member of ours uh, in, in Galeo is a Republican that will be joining the Senate as well. Yeah, I, I forgot to mention. That's fine. I forgot to mention that there's the possibility of one more black man joining from Georgia, depending on the election in January. So right. there, there could be another black man. And I neglected to mention Byron Donalds from Florida, a Republican one in Florida. So you had one Republican uh, black man in the house who decided not to run against Will Hurd mm -hmm. in Texas. So he didn't run again, but we picked up one black Republican uh, right. in Florida. Right, and we um, we also, there's also the possibility in California that the current attorney general uh, might be uh, nominated for the Senate seat that uh, Kamala, Kamala Harris will be. Right. In. Yeah, so that would be an, another Hispanic man in the, um, in the Senate. So, I mean, so the, um, so the legislature, I mean, this is the, the diversification of America in terms of actual political power. We know we've been here all the time. We just haven't been allowed to vote. Uh, and, uh, and so now, and, I, and one of the other things about voter suppression is when people vote for their, when the candidates people vote for it never win. So, you know, see, so success breeds success. And when people understand that when they vote, they can win. Uh, and so one of the questions I'll leave you with before we go to other que questions from the audience is, 
do you think this is the last time we'll see all white presidential candidates? Nate Silver pointed out that Democrats lost three, were 0 for 3 with an all white ticket, and they are 3 and 0 when they have a black person on the ticket. So is this going to be the last election where either of the major parties has an all white ticket given the incredible diversity uh, of our state. What do you all what do you all think that means? Elsie? Well, I've been seeing, I've been hearing about a ticket for 2024 with Kamala Harris at the top and with uh, Castro as the vice president. So people are already starting a lot of noise about a full Afro-Latino ticket. So uh, I don't know whether it'll be the last time we'll see because you know, we're moving into a whole situation of where uh, hopefully that you'll get people who you know are going to do the right thing, even though they are not from your racial group. And so, uh, but I think we have to get to that symbolism of where there is a Latina president, a vice president, and we've had a black president, now we have a black uh Vice President. So I think people want to see that the country will accept these people first before. So it's it's a possibility that that it that we will have a mix, at least a mixed ticket for a while. Um, so we have a question from the pant from the audience. Uh, what advice would you give members of the Black and Latinx community to remain encouraged about the U.S. government? Jerry, you want to take that? Well, I mean, particularly here in Georgia, uh, I think it's, it's vitally important uh, to take that into consideration, given that we have the national importance of determining control in the U.S. Senate uh, for, uh, for any kind of policy agenda to move forward that the president-elect Biden's administration may want to do, uh, they're going to need from Congress, and, and clearly the House of Representatives remained the Democratic control, even though they lost a few seats. Um, but the Senate is, is right now, as it, as it stands, uh, right now is under Republican control. And Mitch McConnell, we know from uh, his, his utterances against the President Obama, was wanting to make President Obama one-term president and worked very, very hard against uh, President Obama's administration. So Georgia is uniquely positioned to determine the outcome of uh, control for the U.S. Senate. So I think it's, it's going to be vitally important to remain engaged in the process, both the Black and Latino and Asian uh, GLBTQ community uh, really have to take a very serious look at this election cycle. And, and women uh, need to take a look at this election cycle and, and make sure that, they, we, that many policy agenda items that we care about are on the table. Uh, that we need to make sure that uh, that our voices are heard in in the in the runoff election because that that's vitally important to what we are doing. So that's why we are continuing in mass our massive effort to continue the the election outreach uh, to ensure that the Latino vote and is going to be out and strong of uh, the runoff election, both the December runoff elections that we have in Georgia and the January runoff elections that we have in Georgia because. Uh, Really, there's a lot at stake for all of our communities, and this is the time to come together and make sure that our voices are heard and are respected uh, in, in the voting process. Yeah, and at the, in so many different ways, communities that vote get more attention and get more support. Uh, and you know, in terms of that January 5th and the young, uh, the, the, the youth of the Latino population is that uh, anyone who is going to be 18 by January 5th can register to vote in this runoff. You don't have to have voted in the general election to vote in the runoff. So, um, so folks need to. We've been spreading the word on that. Yeah, and we had we had many uh, many people that became naturalized citizens uh, after the October deadline to register to vote for the general election that reached out to us and wanted to register to vote, uh, but couldn't for the general, mm -hmm. but they absolutely can uh, for the runoff election and the December is the, is the deadline for them to do that. Yeah, so yeah, December 7th is a registration deadline. If for whatever reason, new to Georgia, just, you know, um, you can still register for that very important election. Um, what do you think the, another question we have from the audience, um, what do you think the future of Georgia will look like with increasing young voter turnout? Um, 
the um, I don't know, Elsie, if your essence survey shows anything on that, if you're if, if are younger voters different than the older black voters, for example? Well, in the essence survey, we found that uh, that the, the Gen Z was more uh, prone toward activism than even the millennials. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's what I find being on a college campus is mm -hmm. that the young people who are on the college campuses now are very service oriented. Mm -hmm. And I think that if, if they continue in the direction they're going, we'll see great things out of many of the young uh, activists now. And they're much more so than even the millennials. And we found the same thing in our survey. Yeah, that's amazing. And I know in Georgia, the, I mean, of course, as you said, DACA was brought about by the young people themselves. So what do you see also in Georgia from the Latinx community, Jerry? Uh, we see a lot of great hope. Uh, and, and I think I'm really inspired by the younger generations uh, within the Latino community. I'm, I'm a Gen Xer, so I'm on the older side of, of things uh, in, in the Latino community. Uh, but uh, the, certainly the millennial community and the uh, Gen Z generation are very involved and very engaged. I think the other piece of that, not just within the Latino community, but as, as Georgia, uh, the younger generation is also multiracial and very mixed. Uh, and and that, that, is, that is, I think, and, and very attuned to social justice issues. Uh, as, as Dr. Elsie Scott was mentioning, that, uh, that I think they, wanna, they want to make the world a better place for their future. Uh, and they're willing to step up and do things about it. And I think that that's a beautiful thing. And we need more of that uh, all across to make sure that uh, elected officials will do what you let them get away with. Uh, we, once they're elected, we need to continue to press the to honor what they promised. Uh, and, and if they're doing things that we don't like, we need to work against them to make sure that they, they will do the things that we as a society want them to do. So a democracy is not just about showing up to vote on election day. It's about engaging and being active and be, expressing your voice and holding elected officials accountable after election uh, is over. So that's part of the role that I think uh, we all can do. And I think that the young generation has really stepped up and I take great inspiration uh, from uh, the younger community, uh, not just within the Latino community, but within the black and the Asian and the mainstream white community as well. They're involved, they're engaged and, and we wanna see more of that. Yeah, it's interesting. Joe Scarborough was saying that the, the, the children of his, uh, his, his children's friends, the ones who from University of Alabama, if they moved to Birmingham, they stayed conservative. But if they moved to Georgia, even the, the white kids became more progressive. I think we have a tremendous political com you know, community here um, that is, is really moving, moving the state forward. And of course, Georgia is in the center of the, uh, of the, of the global economy. Um, and so, the, so we've got to be a global, and we have this tr tremendous heritage of civil rights, of, you know, we're the home of two Nobel Peace Prize winners and Jimmy Carter and Martin Luther King. So, and uh, Coretta Scott King, who should have gotten it. Uh, and so we're, um, you know, we're just uh, really, um, really pleased to have had this conversation. And this is a role that the center wants to play to continue having these conversations to be a place where you know people come together to talk about our multicultural future and our future for civil rights uh, in not, in in Georgia and that Georgia continues to lead uh, lead the country and the world in working uh, working collaboratively on this issue. So with that, I want to really thank both my panelists, uh, Dr. Elsie Scott, Mr. Jerry Gonzalez, for all the work that you're doing, not only now but that you've been doing for years and years and years. Uh, and I hope you feel good about, you know, the fruition of some of your, your labor right now. So with that, I will turn it back over to uh, Krista to close us out. Thank you all so much for joining us uh, for our program today. I want to really quickly go over some weekly actions that you can take to get more involved with um, things that we're talking about in today's conversation. Um, you can become a volunteer for Galileo and all these actions by the way are posted in the chat for you to view the links and copy them. Um, you can make donations to Galileo. 
joined the ACLU of Georgia's team of very dedicated and proactive volunteers. And as well, they also have virtual events that you can attend as well, it's just like these. So thank you to everyone for joining us and um, have a wonderful weekend. Great, thank you.